So as Suchi said, I'm going to be talking about uh, static Drupal and what, it, what you can do to actually make your website static. You don't need to rebuild, you don't need to do any of this stuff. So just kind of some of the options that you'll have um, and some considerations that you'll need to make if you actually want to go the journey of decoupling from traditional serving architecture and moving towards a more Jamstack uh, architecture for how you're serving websites. Um, we'll get into some definitions, we'll get into some uh, you know, use cases and things like that, but yeah, we'll kind of go through that. So um, introductions, I'm Steve. I'm a founder, co-founder of QuantCDN. Um, this is kind of, it's not a sales pitch for QuantCDN, but QuantCDN is a static hosting kind of Drupal integration um, business that we kind of started from a lot of these problems that we had with traditional Drupal hosting. We kind of moved over and we're like, we don't need all of this stuff to serve most of our Drupal sites. We just need to serve the content. And in fact, most CDNs end up being a full static cache anyway. So why bother going through a full, you know, hardcore origin setup when you can just serve static websites. A um, little bit of a plug here, so um, just in general, our, we kind of dog food the stuff that we build, so the QuantCDN website is actually using a lot of this architecture here, so it's a static, it's a Drupal site on the back end that has no public interface, you can't actually access it and it will push all of its content into the static store. Uh, and when you access quantcdn.io, you'll just get um, you know, the static representation of what that site is. Disclaimers, we're going to talk about a bunch of different technology in this. I've used some, not all of them, but it's kind of just a bit of, you know, here's what's in the industry at the moment, some things that you can look at, some things that you can go through and, you know, do your own research and validate things if you actually want to go down this path. Um, you know, we'll talk about things like Netlify and, you know, Vue.js, different static side gens, things like that to kind of go through, um, just some things that you might want to consider. In the presentation, we're going to go through some of this kind of information here. So why static? Why would you ever go bother going through this? You know, you've got a Drupal site. It's working well. What are the, some of the wins uh, and what are some of the cons of actually going through a static uh, rebuild or a static kind of pivot from what you've got now? Some of the static technologies that you've got that, um, at your disposal to, to build static websites. So this can be, you know, from scratch or it can be bolting onto Drupal to make it work how you want it to. Um, some different architectures, so, you know, fully, fully static, partially static, different ways that you can handle, um, you know, going down this journey as well. Um, I'll kind of talk a bit about static Drupal, the quant module and how that works and go through uh, integrating uh, into the, you know, the quant backend or some other ways that you can use, uh, some other modules in the community that you can use for statifying your Drupal website. Hopefully we'll have time for questions, but if not, we can catch up outside and we can go through anything that you want, um, any questions that kind of come up throughout the presentation. So. Let's get into it. Why static? What is it? Why use it? What are the pros and cons? Um, we'll start with a little bit of a, a little bit of a definition from Wikipedia. Best place to get definitions. Um, a static web page is a web page that is delivered to the user's web browser exactly as it's stored, in contrast to dynamic web pages which are generated by a web application. And I think that's kind of the key difference here is that when you've got a traditional Drupal website, any request to origin is going to make database calls, it's going to make cache requests, it's going to do a whole lot of stuff and processing data from a user input to actually build out what that page is um, on the fly. And that's not as performant as, uh, you know, just serving a HTML file that you've, pre you've done that for already. Um, some use cases for static sites. So static websites can be pretty useful in not just, you know, serving your whole website, like that is one use case for them, but, you know, they, they can live alongside your current production website as well and there can be different ways that you can handle um, some static offload or, you know, if you need to... Um, so what, some of the stuff we've got here, um, static archive is kind of one of the big reasons that we actually decided to build QuantCDN was that, you know, the government has a seven-year um, mandate that they need to keep revision history for what the website was. And there's no system at the moment that does it well. Um, and so Quant Static can kind of take snapshots, keep them over time, and let you be able to do that. So what you can do is you can point crawlers at your website, get a whole representation, keep moving through the, um, through the years as you do that. So you've got that point in time reference of what the site was looking like. Uh, disaster recovery, this is one that's actually kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, so we've got, um, what we do is we kind of crawl websites, create static representations, and have them that live alongside your production website. They're not, you know, up to the minute, in, uh, you know, replicas of what your production website is. Usually we, we run it like N minus one, so day minus one kind of thing, but these are just kind of standbys in case a production uh, incident happens and we can swip, swap DNS and go straight to the, um, to the static website to, to give you time to fix whatever causes your production problem. 
Um, and we've actually had to use this uh, a few times with some of our clients as well, which has been super helpful. It just takes pressure off all of the teams who are looking at um, figuring out what the actual problem is. They don't have web traffic coming in, muddling up logs and all that kind of stuff. They can get straight in and have a look at what the problem is and go through that process. Revision history is kind of just a piggyback off the first one. Um, and then static front end, which is the, the whole use case here, is you can actually kind of just decouple your Drupal back end, have the front end that's served directly from a static store. Um, pros and cons, uh, this is a pretty light list. There's plenty more here once you do due do diligence and have a look at it, but here's some of the high level things that I like to talk about. Security, um, pretty, no, uh, pretty self-explanatory that one. There's no, there's no dynamic systems. There's no way that someone can actually access anything important because it's just serving static HTML files to you. Performance, um, same reason. You're just getting served static, static HTML. There's no, there's no dynamic backends. There's nothing there to handle kind of that. So this kind of all ties into one thing. Performance is a big kind of umbrella for all of this stuff. If you've got performant HTML files that are being served, it's scalable. It's greener because your, serve, your hosting infrastructure footprint is lower, all that kind of stuff. Some of the, the cons, it's a little more complex, right? So you're running through it, you, you're working through um, just the many systems. You've got build tools, you've got crawlers, you've got you know, save content pushes, depending on what architecture you use. It, it makes your site more complicated for just general maintenance. Um, static, it's a funny one there, because it's just a con. It's just a bit of a mind shift, which makes it a bit uh, of a con in some use cases, because you've got to kind of start architecting solutions for static to make it work well for you. Um, we'll kind of go into some of these points here in a little bit in the, the next slides, um, just to kind of go through it. So, you know, like, why is, why is static sites more secure? There's, no, there's nothing, there's no backend. There's no backend that's publicly accessible. So you can't hack a CMS if it doesn't exist. If it doesn't have a public interface, you can't talk to it. You know, you can, you can put your Drupal site on a VPN, or you can put it, you know, you can even host it offline and just have it locally and push your, your data up into the, the, into the cloud, be it with Tome or with the quant module. There's no database to hack because, again, all this stuff is not publicly accessible. You can't do any of that stuff if it's not there. Um, how can I be faster? Same thing, right? So it's, it's kind of just building on top of all of the stuff before. You're just serving HTML files. There's no dynamic queries. They're not you're not needing to query databases to build out representations of what a page is. There's no server-side processing. You're doing all of that stuff prior. You do it up front once, push it up, and have it served as HTML from there. Um, same thing, right? So it scales better because you're, you've got just a static file store. It's just using file system I.O. then at that point to be able to scale outwards so you can then scale it to thousands of requests a second very easily because disk speed is much faster than database read and write speed, things like that, right? And so uh, just in general, once you can scale out that way, you can high handle high loads traffic much better than you can with a database. Um, how is it greener? So this is an interesting one. Um, I did a little bit of research on this before to try and get some estimates on, you know, just general carbon usage for how much it would take to have a, you know, a HA Drupal website running don't have the numbers exactly right, but you know it's it's orders of magnitude less just to have you know an S3 bucket that can serve files when you request them. So less energy required to serve, less processing because there's no dynamic access to it, less data transfer because you've already done a lot of that bulk processing, those kinds of things. And this is just kind of the, where it ends up coming to you know business users uh, because there's fewer pieces, there's fewer like the serving infrastructure is, is smaller. You've got uh, you know you've got a lower cost footprint as well, um, so you've got simpler hosting needs, lower resource consumption, easier maintenance because it's just a static store, it's just a uh, you know a storage service somewhere. We're going to get into like when when would someone want to use a static uh, you know a static site instead of a dynamic site. Um, Here's just some general use cases, some things that we've kind of, you know, kind of toyed up with uh, when we're kind of coming through this stuff. So, you know, um, international audiences, and this is kind of, you know, offset a little bit by using a CDN to, to cache your Drupal payload at the moment. So, you know, you'll have it served from edge locations that are closest to them. Um, the problem with, you know, having a traditional CDN is you need an origin server that can handle um, some amount of traffic falling back through to the uh, to the uh, to the origin if the CDN is either you know stale cache, cold cache, all of those kinds of things. Um, so you still need to have some origin infrastructure to be able to handle higher load load periods. 
Um, if your website is, you know, just a brochure website, kind of those types of things, you know, single page application type thing, doesn't have a lot of, you know, dynamic pieces, it's just information. That's a, you know, best use case for a static site, just kind of build it with Next, build it with a, you know, Jekyll, some static site generator, have markdown files, don't let, you don't need marketing teams to write it, they can give you the copy, those kinds of things. Um, get those going, push them up. Security focused, kind of touched on it before, but you know, because there is no dynamic area, there's no way if someone can hack it. Um, so if you've got, you know, a lower, you know, you've got a, a website that doesn't have a lot of dynamic functionality, you know, doesn't have a lot of um, moving pieces, you can, you can lock it down even further by not allowing um, any, any kind of front ingress into your website, into the, you know, the, the dynamic backend, whatever that is. And we kind of touched on that one before. Uh, static techno technologies, let's get into uh, some things that you can use to build out different websites. So when we're talking about static technology stack, we, we kind of break it down into a few different areas. Um, so there's the content source. Where is your data coming from? Is it coming from flat files? Is it coming from databases? Um, what kind of methods can you use to get the static representation from wherever it's stored into a static host that can then serve it out um, as it needs to? So there's plenty of different ways that you can do that. Some of them are you can use a scraper or a crawler to kind of snapshot what the browser will see, push that up. You can use a static site generator, something like Jekyll, um, to you know, build out template files and push that up. You can use um, Drupal modules so they can handle you know, rendering. You, can just, you don't even need to change your current workflows. You can just you, you know, build a Drupal theme, do, use technology that you're currently familiar with, and then have it render a static representation of what that site is, and then push that somewhere to be hosted. Um, and then the last thing to think about in, you know, in your static technology stack is where you're going to host it. Is it going to be S3? Is it going to be Azure Blob Storage? Is it going to be Netlify? Is it going to be Quant CDN? You know, there's plenty of places that you can host it. Plenty of places give you different functionality sets. Plenty of places take things on for you, give you power to do it yourself. So you know, like, if you're hosting an S3 directly, you might need CloudFront to serve from S3. You might want to use Lambdas to do certain edge things, you know, things like that. If you use, you know, CloudFront pages or Cloudflare pages, sorry, they've got different things. You know, they've all got, you know, roughly the same technology space. So they've all got like functions at Edge. If you want to do microservice thing with your static site as well, so um, plenty of plenty of different options that you can use to look at doing that. Um, we're kind of going to run through just some high level, uh, you know, sources and each each point on that last slide. We'll kind of go through just just some general stuff here. So. Uh, the content sources, so yeah, as I was mentioning before, you know, there's plenty of different ways that you can decide to author content for your static website. You can use data files in, in the repository, you can kind of manage markdown, right, and you can manage that that way, you can give uh, editors access to a GitHub repo, for example, and they can create content directly with markdown files in the Git interface. Um, or you can go through and, you know, you can make it an API backend. And so this is what, you know, Dries was touching on this morning with web services and um, decoupled Drupal instances, for example. You can have a Drupal instance that's locked down that just serves a content API that your front end can read from and build out, you know, different web experiences for different users. Um, <laughs> the next thing that we, could, uh, we can look at is how do we get that representation of what the static website is to a static service? Um, and, and a host, so we'll either use um, you know crawlers or we'll push, right? So it'll either be like a GitHub you know CI/CD pipeline, which we we'll kind of talk about in the next one. Site generators versus crawlers. These are kind of two high-level um, approaches for how you get your static content from wherever you're rendering or whatever you're building it with. You know, Drupal Drupal site can be crawled if it's publicly accessible, or if it's not, right? You can. Um, Give the, give the crawler access to it either via VPN or basic auth or you know, whatever you want to do to do it that way. Um, some, some crawlers are on, that uh, can help with this kind of stuff, you know, like this, this scrapey, simple crawler. And Quant also has a crawler as well, so if you wanted to sign up and have a look, you can build a crawler out and, have, and send it at your website and go and run through that. So they all kind of use different technology under the hood, so they all kind of scrape and crawl slightly differently, whether you know, they're using Selenium and stuff like that to render web pages, or if they're just kind of scraping markup and doing that. They're all slightly different, so it's, it's hard to choose a, you know, which one's best. It's kind of you know, evaluate each tool for its own merit and then go through that kind of stuff to figure out which one would work better for your use case. Um, static site generators are, are much the same, right? They're, like, it's kind of exploded over the last like year and a bit, right? Just how many different front-end generators there are that you can use. 
Um, here's some, just, you know, just some to name a few, right? Like, if you have a look, like, I think Netlify has a list of, like, 64,000 or something, just different static site generators for every type of language, every flavor, especially in the, in the, uh, the Node.js space. I think, like, everybody's first thing to do is create a framework from a framework and just fork it and go through that process. So, um, you know, that you can use things like Next, Go, Hugo, if you've got, a, you know, like a Go, um, Go, development house, you know, you can just use, there's so many. Pick one that you feel comfortable with or that you think is fun. They all do the same thing, really. Um, they all have different levels of integration into a, a CMS, so this is probably one thing that you want to consider when you're choosing a static site generator. Um, what's the community like? How have they integrated with different APIs? Um, so things like Gatsby has pretty good Drupal integration. So if you're going to manage your Drupal site and expose content via a web API, Something like Gatsby might get you that, that bit there, and it's just building a front end at that point. You don't need to worry about abstracting APIs and working on integrations that way. Things like Druxt, there's a pretty good, um, so it uses Nuxt, and then they built Druxt on top of it, which is a bunch of connectors into simple, you know, um, the REST modules, what it outputs in Drupal. So there's plenty of, plenty of places that you can use to um, look at that. And then there's some other, other things that you can look at that kind of work slightly differently. So. The front, the, the ones up right, the right, <laughs> the right side is backwards. Like, um, so like your Next, your, your Hugo, your Gatsby's, your Jekylls, all those kind of tools kind of want you to rebuild your website with them. They've got templating engines, they've got all that kind of stuff. So you've got to manage CSS, you've got to manage rebuilding your, your Drupal theme essentially uh, in, the, in those languages. So you know, Gatsby's Node, Next.js is Node, Hugo's Go, Jekyll's Ruby, all those kinds of things. Um, so it is a little bit of upfront kind of investment if you want to move on this path. Uh, the, then you come to like Quant and Tome, and they have Drupal integration. So Tome, you might be familiar with, is a Drupal module that can create a static representation of your website. Um, and Quant is a, has a similar module that does a similar thing, but uh, they, they work slightly differently in that Tome will create like an archive. It'll go through. Uh, make HTTP requests to all of your website and then give you a zip file at the end of it say, here you go, go do something with this, this is yours now. Where the Quant module is a little more tailored into Quant's hosting offering, so you enable the Quant module and it will push your static content straight up, ready for you to serve. Just a bunch of different things that you can use to um, analyze and, and help go through this static journey, because... Um, It's pretty, it's pretty fun once you get into it. We kind of mentioned static hosting before, but you know, here's a bunch, there's, there's even more than this. This is just a, you know, like a subset of uh, where you can host websites. You can spin up EC2s, you can use GoDaddy, you can use whatever you need, right? But because at the end of the day, a static website is just HTML pages, and most, most hosting providers can do that pretty well. Um, there is a bunch of these that do have Drupal integrations, so they can kind of work slightly differently. Um, you know, S3 has Drupal integration, so you can push up Drupal files to S3 directly, so you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. You can like <clears throat> tailor your your workflow and your CI/CD pipeline to scrape and crawl the web content and have files pushed directly to S3, and you can kind of work on that depending on how you want to manage a static website. Um, and then yeah, you know, like you, you GitHub Pages is actually probably one of the lowest barriers, right? If you use Jekyll and GitHub Pages, you can create a static website really, really simply. Uh, now we're going to get into some a little bit more technical stuff, uh, but it's still I'll still keep it pretty high level just to kind of you know introduce the topic of static and just how you, you might need to start thinking about different problems when you're working through this stuff. So um, when I think about it, we have generally two different ways to do static, and you have a fully static site which is completely decoupled from any backends. You potentially integrate with other services to provide like form submissions and things like that if you want to do that. So, you know, for example, um, you can create something that integrates with um, um, SendGrid if you need to send emails from your static website rather than having a mail server and doing all that stuff yourself. You kind of create a small form that does a submission directly and you can do all that client side or you can have a microservice that handles that. The other, the other, uh, the other architecture that we've kind of started to look at is partially static. Um, and this kind of relies on your CDN or where you're serving from to be able to support some of this stuff. 
But what, what effectively you do is you kind of create your static website, you push up your static assets into the, into the static hosting environment, but then you proxy um, paths back to your, for example, Drupal website. So say you build like web forms and you want to have Drupal handle web form submissions. What you do is you can then proxy the Drupal web form submission URL back to your origin server and you can lock that down and say, you know, put a WAF on it, only allow basic or to make that request. You can do all of that kind of stuff. Now I'm, now I'm panicking. <laughs> um, and yeah, so proxies, proxies is how you can kind of do partially decoupled. And we've seen some pretty good examples of that. Um, we have a, a bunch of uh, clients to kind of manage that now where they push all of their uh, web form submissions back into Drupal and manage all of that because they've got, you know, legacy process internally where their content editors know how to manage the web form submissions. They know what data they're collecting. They know how to, you know, do that. So they didn't want to change everything too much, but they wanted to reduce some... Um, you know, their footprint on how they can serve and manage dependencies and all that kind of stuff with, you know, the things that Static kind of really um, talks about. So uh, we kind of, I don't think we really touched on pros and cons of a crawler, but um, we'll, we'll kind of go that here. So um, one of the ways to get, so in this, I don't think my mouse is going to work. Oh, hey. So these, these two things here, right? So this is how you get your content from which, wherever it is and push it into the static hosting environment. So either crawling or using a static site generator with CI pipeline that does a build and pushes it up. Um, so in this case, pros and cons of a crawler is it's, re it's really simple, right? Depending on your front end, depending on how complicated your front end is, it might, your results might vary, but um, it's much more simple than re-architecting your entire site in a different language. Um, Crawlers will not need backend access. They can just talk. They will basically be an anonymous user against your website, take all of the web content. They can wait for JavaScript, any kind of event-driven stuff that you've already got in your Drupal theme, for example. Get that representation, create the, the HTML file, push it up into the hosting environment. So super simple to set up, very easy to go through. Um, mileage may vary on different crawlers based on what technology they're using under the hood. Um, the, uh, one of the downsides is it doesn't change when content changes. So you'd have to schedule crawls, for example, and, or do something like that. And I might remember, um, if I can digress a little bit, <laughs> back, in the, back in like the early 2000s, we used to use like um, WebSphere and there was like a, a compile stage that we had to go through as developers. Content team would write a new file and we'd have to go in and run a build and push it up to the server. So using a crawler kind of brings back some of that, you know, that kind of technology. Uh, it's not good or bad, but, it, you know, it's just a consideration that you'd have to manage different work, um, publishing workflows if you go through crawlers. I'd say crawlers are more uh, beneficial if the site doesn't change very often. So if you've kind of got, you know, like a content website that just sits there, doesn't need to do anything, we can reduce our hosting costs by making it static and serving from a static store. We can crawl it once, maybe every couple of months or something, it might change and we need to update it. Um, but that goes through that. And then um, on, the, on the other hand, we've got the static site generators. So they're more complex because you might have to rebuild your website unless you use something like Tome or the Quant module. Um, generally, if you're going through an, like a, you know, an evaluation process, validating what you need to do, to, to rebuild your front end. If you're going to go through a you know, site redesign, it might be time to go through that and evaluate the different front end technologies that are available to be able to kind of adapt to what uh, you know, the changing market of um, you know, front end experiences and things like that. You can do some pretty cool stuff with the JavaScript libraries. Um, these are a little more complex in that you need to have a mechanism that will push that static generation into your static host. And so that's when you look at things like GitHub Actions or you know, SCI CD provider that can do that stuff for you. They'll run a build in the pipeline and then they'll push the result to your host. Um, unless you use things like Netlify or uh, the Quant module, which they can react to content change directly and do handle that push for you um, based on what your editors are doing in Drupal rather than having to have a separate process to manage deployments. <laughs> Um, we've probably gone through this in a high level when I've been talking about all the other stuff because it's all pretty inter interconnected. But um, as I mentioned before, you know, static Drupal is really good if your site uh, doesn't change content a lot, doesn't have a lot of dynamic features on it um, and things like that. So um, if, you're, if you're in that kind of co category, you can scrape and upload, keep those sites, uh, you know, reduce your hosting footprint by having those available as, you know, Static, so, um, static serving um, versions of those websites. 
it's a stop for me, is it? <laughs> um, here's some just, you know, just examples of what it might look like. This is a, probably not the best example, this is wget, but I don't know who would do a crawler with wget, that seems a little silly to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, if you, if you want, you can use wget and just put the, put the markup somewhere for what your Drupal site is. There's plenty more complicated things that you could do with Selenium and actually re render JavaScript, have it react to what the user's doing, doing all that kind of stuff, which is a much better way. Um, we've got an example here of what the quant, quant crawler can do. So it uses Selenium under the hood. Um, so it will actually render the JavaScript on your page and do all that kind of stuff as well. And uh, yeah, uh, now Suji's making me scared again. <laughs> um, so when, you, when, you, when you're talking about syncing and crawling, you've got these kind of questions to answer. How often are you going to upload changes? What's going to, ch uh, how are you going to manage the, the change with your, you know, your, your publishing um, teams and things like that? Uh, and when you think about like a SaaS crawler, you can schedule those things so you can do that. You, know, you can kind of just work through those kind of, um, those abilities there, just depending on what your, uh, your needs are. Um, so we kind of touched on this as well, but you see here, so this is um, the generally when you want to talk static with Drupal, it's using Tome. Um, it's a pretty good module for just generating a static dump of what your site is. Uh, and then there's the quant module, which kind of piggybacks off some of the stuff that Tome does, uh, but then pushes it directly to a host for you. Um, so here's, if you want to run through how you would do a deployment with quant, um, you know, you create a quant account, you go through, you install the quant module, you enable it, you configure it with the configuration options that the, the, the quant will give you. Uh, and then you just kind of run two Drush commands. You, you, see, you, queue, you run seed queue, which creates, uh, you know, back -end background worker jobs for all of the content that's in your website. Then you run run queue, which will have some uh, concurrent processing of that. And that will handle running, um, you know, Selenium in the background and kind of doing what it needs to do to push the, the data up. Um, and then with Netlify and Tome, if you're going to use that to handle uh, be your static host, you run Tome Generate, you install the modules, you run Tome Generate, and then you get that, that output and do a Netlify deploy. Um, but that needs to be a, a manual task that you run afterwards. You can automate those stuff, simply run cron if you need to, but you know, still manual to do that deployment. Um, when we talk about these two modules for Drupal syndication into your static host, uh, Quant will generate the seed. You, you initially generate a seed, uh, and that will be the, like the initial output of all of the current state of what your Drupal is. Uh, and then the Quant module will track change as it happens. So as an editor changes a file or changes a node, sorry, you will, um, Quant will requeue that asset and all related assets, and then handle a push back on uh, you know on Cron or whenever you've got that configured. Um, and then with Netlify, you've got to generate that, uh, the static output and then do the deploy every time. I think I made it. Did I make it? <laughs> uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Well, we've got two minutes. Uh, yeah, do we have any questions? I kind of went through that pretty quickly. <laughs> So it's debatable, right, uh, as most things are with the internet. But um, generally, the rule of thumb is even if you've got a, like a 99% cache offload, you still need to have an origin server available in case something's not cached and the, the web request needs somewhere to go. So uh, with static site, you kind of think of, you reverse the paradigm, right? So a traditional host has a push. I might <laughs> using my hands. Uh, so, it's a, pull, it's a pull mechanism with a traditional CDN. So you go through, the CDN will make the request to origin. It'll do all of its request coalescing at the top and you know, whatever it needs to do to help handle distributing that load. But it still needs to talk to your origin to be able to generate that output. Where in static sites, you've done that process up front and you've pushed that result in. So it never needs to talk to it again. And so um, it can handle that at, at, at scale. And if you need to change something, you can push it straight in rather than having your backend manage it that way. So, it's just slightly changing the paradigm there, so it's not kind of directly pulling from origin. You can turn origin off, you can do all that kind of cool stuff with, with static, where you can't do that with a traditional dynamic backend. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to say no. I haven't done. I haven't done it with that many pages before, but it would just take time. It would just be a time thing for you then. So, um, one of some of the static sites I've seen, you know, are up to like tens of thousands. So it's pretty pretty high, um, and it's just kind of depending on which method you use to to generate and push. Um, most static site generators handle building deltas, and so you keep a like a list of things that have been built already, and then you kind of just build the change each time. So the initial seed and the initial kind of deployment of your static site will be slow if you've got 100,000 pages. But then after that, it should be you know much faster because you're kind of only doing what changes or what needs to be pushed after that point. Yeah, I mean, that comes down to browser performance more than anything, right? Like, so it depends on how complicated your front-end application is. Um, what it would be is that the, the static site would be served to your end user much faster, and then all of the front-end processing would happen there. So it depends on what that front-end app is doing. But yeah, there's, um, so the initial, the initial payload of the HTML body is fast, then your application is as fast as it is, depending on what it's doing. That's not a real good answer, but I don't have a better one. <laughs> uh, I haven't used static site generators, so my disclaimer at the beginning, I haven't used them all. <laughs> uh, but I imagine static site generators like Tome. And so it would work in a similar way where you have to generate the, the static output and then do a deployment where quant is tracking change in Drupal as it goes and does the deployment for you as things change. So very slight difference. All right, thanks a lot, Steve. Cool.